Welcome to Ming Presents the Reup, a conversation with the artistic mind. What's up, Double Cheese? It, it, you know, I, I keep, every guest I have starting to look more and more like me. It's sort of like when you have a dog. <laughs> you look like the dog. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but we've had that problem for a lot of years now, so, I mean. I know, you got some red in your beard, though. Uh, yeah, it's mostly red in here. It's always been that way, but yeah. Um, by the way, you should see this ghetto contraption I have holding the phone up. Oh yeah, man! It's I'm sure it's, it's like it's like it's, it's like made with uh, duct tape and, and it's it's hilarious. <laughs> okay, I think I've got it. Well, I didn't oh, realize. Just, I'm going to tell you right now. We're going to get roasted this entire time because oh. so many people hit me up when they saw we were doing this. My sister was like, "Oh, my brothers! I'm going to get I'm going to get on top of them." <laughs> and then and Jackie and I see I see Caroline is there. Oh, this That's is great. <laughs> Uh, All right, cool. You know, I so. thought of you. I mean, obviously, we're always talking and, and whatnot, but I did a re up last um, last Friday with Fat Fu, and one of the one of the people yeah. that Fat Fu had worked with, sort of like in this odd way, was Prince. Yeah, and he ended up being he started with Prince being the um, the keyboardist, like sound guy or like programming guy. He would put to I don't know, he put the, the you know the libraries together for him, and that's how we got involved with Prince. Just you know, like one of those weird sort of like you start with something and then. He ended yeah. up, I think he was doing like front of house or oh, that's a weird monitors story. or something like some weird, you know, like I forget what he had told me, but you ended up working for Prince. Um, tell me about how that happened. And then like, because that's not what you normally do. <laughs> no, I know. It was sort of a weird, it's just a, a weird chance thing. But so my old school homie, awesome producer engineer uh named Pete kepler he's actually probably my first real mentor in the business really so he was a guy that i met who had a room at looking glass studios and he was at that was his room for production and recording and all that and anyways um i we became friends over the years but so that was so 2011 it was he called me and he knows I'm a, I'm basically a mixer producer. He knows I'm not in, in the studio specifically. Yeah. He knows I'm not really doing a live engineer. A, any tour work. Now it's funny. I did do some tour work with him with nine inch nails, but that's really my, was my only tour. Um, and I, of course I was going to do it one because it was peep, but also it was nine inch nails. How could I say no to that? Right. So he, but he called and he was like, you know, I've got this, gig that I think you might want to do for Prince and he couldn't do it because he was on the road with uh, mixing front of house for Katy Perry um, so it's a really long story but basically I ended up yeah working for Prince and mixing monitors um, and also recording multi-tracking the whole tour so so yeah it was just one tour that from beginning to end that I actually survived and that ended up with like I mean, the stories are amazing. I mean, I don't really think about it that often until you, some, you know, somebody brings it up and I think of, oh, yeah, that time I was with Prince and this happened. I mean, that's kind of how Fafu was. Yeah. One yeah. time I was listening to Fafu talk. He did another interview. It was like, a, you know, an interview. And I had, you know, we'd hung out a ton and done work and never really talked about that particular thing because he was at Paisley Park and he, you know, the crazy hours that were happening over there. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and he had crazy stories and, you know, the, the basic MO was always that Prince has this th thing where you're either in with him or you're going to be gone. Yeah. Like, if the vibe is wrong for him, you're gone. So yeah. it always speaks a lot for people who can either ha had the temperament to be around him or yeah. had the right vibe to be around him because it helped him be creative. And obviously being, I mean, I can't imagine being Prince's, you know, monitor mix engineer. It's just, it's, it feels like the worst gig you could possibly have because you're the person who ruins or makes his show basically. Well, it, it, it's, it's sort of, I mean, in all in all kind of transparency, I sort of lucked out in a way because Prince's monitor mix uh, for for the geeky people here, you'll you'll understand what I'm talking about, and I won't get too geeky. But basically, he didn't really have a monitor mix. His monitor mix was basically the front of house mix, mm -hmm. fed fed through all the side fills. So because he didn't like monitors, so 
that was a whole other, I mean, we could dive into that for a day on what that was like, but it created a lot of issues just technically. Because, because it was loud. Because extremely loud. Yeah. The onstage volume was crazy. Um, was he going deaf, you think? I don't, no, no, no. It was about control. It, 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 so, so my, I had like 12 mixes or something going to the band and everybody and what, you know, whatever was going on. Cause it was a massive stage. I mean, it was, that was the old school, um, print symbol stage in the round, which yeah. basically filled up an arena. So, I mean, this setup was just crazy. Um, so big, but, um, so when it came to feeding his monitors, he didn't want to split from my desk. He only wanted to split from the front of house output and he knew his he knew his terminology he knew all that stuff you couldn't fool him right so so he knew what he wanted so and and that was about control so basically if if you changed something in the mix you being the front of house mix so what's going to the audience he wanted control of so if you turn his vocal down he will hear it and and you're not going to fool him and i saw that many times on that tour where people somehow wanted to do what they wanted to do and not inform him of it. And it didn't work out so well. He would like, what would people do? They they would, they would just change. Here's a, here's a curious question from a technical standpoint, Yeah, because the front of house mix to, let's say the stadium or the, the arena, that actual mix, but what's coming out of the powered monitors to the arena changes the way that it's perceived by the audience because there's power distribution towards sub subwoofers and mid-range and tweeters so you do do a front of house mix but that gets then is being amplified by a lot of power but on stage it's actually not the same as what's happening out there because what's on stage is not the same setup that's the rest of the universe is hearing sure so I mean, he it's, may it's, not yeah. or he did did he just like sort of be like okay I'm used to what it sounds like on stage, so any derivation from that, even though I know it's changing, is going to be a problem. Because I remember, you know, because that's not, you know, what I'm saying, like, if yeah, you're playing I mean, arena, I mean, that all of a sudden it's bassier. The the gist of it is that you're not going to hear the exact sonics, of course, but you're going right. to hear the the balance of the mix coming out of the stereo feed, because it was still a left and right setup. There was no like multi tier, uh, uh, multi channel uh, quad or five one output. It was mm-hmm. still a, it was still based on a stereo mix from the console. So because of that, even though sonically, obviously, he's not getting subwoofers and that sort of stuff in the side fills and stuff, but he can still hear the basics of what the mix is. You know what I mean? And because of that, he had control. So, I mean, there, I mean, oh, my God, there are so many. That's tell a story. I, don't just, uh, I mean, have, I know I'm, try, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of what would be appropriate. But, like, for example, there was a, a situation where um, during a rehearsal, or sound check, I should say. Um, came in, did a sound check, played a couple songs, um, and we were, you know, during sound check, it's just like a show. We're all, I'm, I'm, everybody's, I'm mixing, I'm recording, everybody's doing their job as if it was a live show. Um, and he decided to grab the bass for one song because he was, of course, it's Prince. He was also a dope bass player. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so he played he, everything, right? He played everything. Yeah, he played everything. Um, so he he joins in and grab and he's by the way he's not on stage. It's all you know RF based. So he's but he's playing along with the band. So he's off stage, and I can't remember if he was underneath the stage, or I, I think he was. But so he's playing the song, they're jamming it, and he says, "Can you record that?" So record that take, um, send it to him. On it, burn it to disc real quick. Send it to him. He goes to his, uh, to his, uh, you know, wardrobe, whatever. Um, and he basically comes back and he's and he just says, "Why'd you turn my bass down? <laughs> when did you turn and, my bass no, down? Or why, why? Why? Why did you turn my bass down?" And that and that turned into a huge issue, and it didn't end very well. You know what I mean? But that was the start. It was sort of like, you know, just give Prince what he wants. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and and that was sort of the thing. I mean, and I think this goes for anything Prince related. It's like, he knows what he wants. And I think there's a lot of ego involved with the people that get to work with him and they want to do what they want somehow. They want to, they want to like put their stamp on it or whatever, or I'm going to, yeah, I'll give Prince what he wants, but I'm also going to make it sound better or whatever. I'm, you know what I mean? And 
that's not the right approach. It's just do what he wants. He's got the ears, and you're not going to be able to fool him. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And generally speaking, the people that tried to do that, they'd get the boot. You know, sometimes it would be really quick, or sometimes it would take, you know, a week or two. But, like, it was a revolving door. I mean, there were people getting fired every day. Um, it's so, one way or another. I, you know, that always, because, look, I've, I've been on tour for, you know, many, many cities, and I couldn't imagine having to replace somebody in the middle of a tour because of the the institutional knowledge that you gain by being on tour with these people. It'd be very hard to replace, no matter who it is. Yeah. Goodbye, see you later, and the new person comes in and has no idea what is going on technically. But they're good at what they do, but it's still a trial by fire. I couldn't imagine, even as a musician, like not liking somebody wanting to fire someone because well, or firing them because you'd be like, well, I might have just hurt my show. Oh, dude, you're totally right. I mean, it was it was counterproductive. There's no doubt about it. But it, it, there wasn't really any avoiding it. That's just sort of what the situation was. That's and nobody, how it, could, that's how yeah, it nobody, ran. nobody said no to Prince. You know what I mean? And that's sort of the. I mean, as I look back on it, and also now hearing all the stories of the years of people that have worked with Prince and all this, it's like there there are people that did work with him and really got it. Like, I, I, I read some really good Susan Rogers interviews of her recording yeah. Prince in, in the early days, and I her approach was the right approach. It was it was give Prince what he wants. He, Prince is in charge. He's the, he's the producer of everything, really. Yeah. And, and your job is to basically give the artists what they want. It's not about you. It, that, that's the key thing in the whole thing working for Prince is it's not about you. It's about him and what, you know, his music, his art. So right. if you can take away the, the ego in that, um, it's a lot easier to do your job. And you get less precious about like, oh, but I, you know, I really thought the 5K sounded good on the snare drum. It's like, <laughs> fuck that. Fuck that. It, he, he's going to hear it. I mean, there were times when, in the house that they were building up a mix and sound check or something. And keep in mind, I'm mixing monitors. So, um, which was crazy in its own, its own way. But so I'd listen to what was going on in the house and, and I was like, you know, thinking, all right, he asked for this, but they're trying to make it more sophisticated, more modern, brighter, more compression, whatever. And I was like, he's going to hear it. And that's what would happen is he would come in, 30 minutes later or whatever. And it's funny because when he would enter the building, you would know it most of the time because you could hear a pin drop. It was right. Like, right. His entourage have arrived. It was, f- I, oh, I loved it. See, I'm the only, I'm one of the few people who was loving every second of the Prince experience. Cause I loved him so much. You know what I mean? I, I didn't care about any of the craziness cause I could, I could handle it. It was fine. Well, I also you know, think but, for but, you, because but, you're not a front of house or a, a, you know, a monitor, that's not your career. Right. For you, you were like, I'm on this sort of like, I'm interloping on the best tour that I could possibly <laughs> interlope on, right? You went yeah, from Nine yeah. Inch Nails to Prince, and yeah. you're doing these two amazing tours where you, and also, I think you're tracking it, you're tracking every show, which is amazing. So yeah, you're yeah. also, you're cataloging, which is very important. I mean, he was, it, especially during that time, but I think that's, that's something really cool. That you're yeah. like, I don't care how this goes. I'm, I'm making sure I don't screw the recordings up. And Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I obviously I cared that it went well, but you do it, it it's like, I mean, to me, I thought about it like I was producing a record. You know, it's like right, you, right. you are still in the service business, but at the same time, um, it, 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 there, there is a certain, uh, every artist is going to have their own sort of needs and demands. It, it changes for, as you know, for every every person is different. So, and his needs and demands were pretty specific. And, it, and, and the funny thing is they act, it was, I know it sounds crazy, but it wasn't really that difficult. He wanted things to be natural, warm. He didn't want things overhyped and over EQ'd and over. And, and in terms of a mixer's perspective, um, some people may take that as, Oh man, I don't get to do what I do. And that's where the ego gets involved. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that, that became that I could see that up, that was such a problem. And the other thing, you're right. I mean, I wasn't doing tours or, I mean, that wasn't really, you're right. What I was doing is for my career, but so I came into it sort of with a level head and I got to this massive crew where 98% of the crew is angry and disgruntled AF. Like everybody is on 11 and they're about to pop. 
and they don't know how to handle prints and they don't know how to just let it go and just say, you know what? I'm just going to do the gig. It's just, it's a gig. It's yeah. Prince, but it's still a gig, you know? And so if he wants me to take the 10 K off the snare, I'm going to take the, you know what I mean? I'll take it off. Right. Like, right, right, right. You know, it, I'm not going to get personal about it. That's what he wants. And, and you can, and that's the thing is you could, a lot of people you can fool. They might not have ears and you could maybe get your little you know, adjustment in there and think, all right, I got, I, I did my job. He's going to hear it. He's going to, I mean, I'll never forget one day he came in and the crew, the current crew that hadn't been fired yet <laughs> had a mix up. And like, yeah, I'm thinking this is sounding pretty dope. And the, and the systems tech was doing all the EQ to the PA and all this. And, and Prince comes in and he starts listening and, um, and he goes, and he looks around and just goes, I don't even, I don't even feel like I can hear the band. I mean, talk about devastating. It's just like, and then he just went to the desk and took all the faders and just went and dropped them all down to zero. And then he, he took the talkback mic into the whole arena and he just goes, John, John Blackwell, which rest in peace, he was the drummer of that tour. He goes, get on the kit, hit your kick drum. So and then he turned around and I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said something to somebody that was like, "All right, I'm going to build the mix." I mean, he, no, no joke. So I'm sitting there. So it was a strange setup because my console and rig was sort of just off to the side of the front of house rig, so right. I could see everything. That's not normal. Normally, that's sort of like right off stage. But so I'm witnessing all this, and he takes and he's talking to the to the mic, and he just goes, "Hit your kick drum." It goes boom. Boom, you know, he's getting him and turns it up and then he just looks and he sings and then he goes, Stop. And he just goes, I don't even feel like I can hear the kick. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh. and 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 but the, here's the thing. He made and he made them re EQ the whole PA. Sorry if this is too geeky, but he made them No, it's not. It's not re EQ it's just, the whole It goes to his like it yeah. goes to his um his art, but, artistry. Yeah, but here's the thing. He was right. He was right. For for what he wanted, he was right. I mean, he, he wasn't a dummy at all. This dude was extremely, you know, smart. So for what he wanted, they had to take the layers of EQ off. They had to do all this stuff to just get more of a natural uh, sound coming from the instrument battling this arena. Do you know? Yeah. I mean, it's hard. to It's, it's tough to mix in an arena, of course, but um, he knew what he wanted. And it was, I mean, that was the most impressive part. It was like, you know, he, he, of course he's crazy. Of course, nobody said no to him in, <laughs> in 35 years or whatever. You know what I mean? 30, you know, he, he's, I mean, that was one thing that I remember my first day joining the crew um, in, in, I think we're in Hamilton. And it was in an arena that they had basically uh, rented just for rehearsals. And um, I get in and I can't remember the exact request, but some, somebody from management had come down and requested something from the video crew. And this is, a, keep in mind, this is a massive crew. Video, audio, lighting, mm -hmm. da, 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 carps, everything. And video basically said, no, it's like, that's not possible what you're asking for. And and the the woman manager, I can't remember her exact role, but she was some somehow in the management. She just goes, well, just figure it out. You know, just do it. I'm like, well, sorry, we don't you don't understand it's not technically possible to do what you're asking for. And she just goes, listen, um, that that's not an acceptable answer for me to give to Prince. So figure <laughs> out, figure out a way for it yeah. to, to do something, you know, and it was sort of like, and that created like, you know, just the, the people on the, on the road generally just couldn't handle that. You know, it just drove them crazy. You no, know? no, no two, two questions off of that. Do you think, and I've heard this from other artists now, granted Prince, because of the body of, of work that he has, has done and because of how, what an incredible live performer he is or was, um, you know, there's some people where you feel like a lot of that is just fluff to be a star. He, how much of that do you think was his perfectionism and how much of that do you think it was his persona? You know, in terms of, like, I get the perfectionism part of it, but how much of that you think is also part of his persona that was just making being difficult, and that's what made people crazy? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, it, 
it's tough to say. I mean, because I didn't really get to know him personally. Mm, like, right, right. You know what I mean, it's not like I... Which is unusual, because most of the artists that I've worked with, we end up becoming sometimes really close friends. Yeah, because you're around them all the time. Yeah, and, and, it's and like we're working, you know, in, in close uh, proximity, making a record and you know, all that. With Prince, I probably had 15 actual conversations with him. You know what one I mean? One was, get me some pancakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one was like, you know, I'll kick your ass in, in basketball or whatever. <laughs> Or in ping pong. He, oh, here's a good one. Okay, this is a good. So did, did he I play ping pong under the? He, under he, the... He was a, yeah, he's a ping pong guy, and he. T- so I told you that story, right? Well, I'll tell. No, again. no. I mean, so... okay. So, so he carried a ping pong table on the road. So wherever we were, in whichever arena it was, because it was an arena tour, so it was always some kind of big venue like that. There was always a spare room somewhere uh, where he could set up a full on ping pong table and have battles with the band. And the crew, you know, and and apparently, according now, I got to know his at the time his number one security guy, uh-huh. um, and so we we became buddies on that on that tour. Jackie said, "What and, up, cheeseburgers? Can you see oh, her yeah. posting?" <laughs> oh shit! What's up? Um, oh man, I'm okay. Let me. Let, I won't get sidetracked. Okay, so um, where, so so you had a ping pong table and. And apparently, according according to those the uh, the band and everybody, it was like he he was a badass ping pong player. I mean, he didn't ping pong player, and he didn't want to lose. I mean, he was competitive. What was would like, happen if you lost? I don't know. I, I don't really know. But but he would he would battle people, and he would kick their ass. Now who know you know? And so um, at one point, okay, this is great. I, I might as well tell this whole story. So. I don't want, if I'm, by the way, if I'm wasting too much time up. No, no, man, you tell the story, so, this is a good one. I like, so, I love this story. <laughs> so, one show, and I can't remember which city we were in, but, um, he, he's going on really late. You know, the, the crowd is going nuts. I mean, really late, like an hour and a half late. It, you know, like the and show this is an arena where, the, where there's, there's time limits. You only have, oh yeah, I mean, it's and, all and that, union. You can't play after a certain amount of time. So right. You're like really pushing the needle. Oh, totally, and that's a that's an, a very big distinction because um, the 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 staff of the venue are starting to freak out every every ten minutes, fifteen minutes. They're freaking out more and more be, on the radios and all that because they know once you push it past a certain time for for the breakdown, the union uh, you know yeah, it becomes a, wages, it becomes a nightmare. It's like double yeah. It's and and all this money is lost. You know all that. So they, they have to really start those on time to not lose money. So Prince is like, he don't give a shit. Show starts at, I think, 7. It was like almost 8.30, right? Okay. <laughs> the, the venue is completely packed. Lights are on. Band is on stage. Band is on stage waiting. And people, I mean, the, the, the chaos, it, it, I mean, my memory of it is just hilarious because I'm... I'm just sitting there, like, waiting to go. And everybody's, like, running around, like, where, where is he? Oh, get that, you know, how dare he? You know, like, you right. know, it was, it was just hilarious. So then on the radio, he he gets on the radio, and he basically is like, um, tell the crew or somebody to get my ping pong table. And, <laughs> and, and this is a true story. Get my ping pong table and put it underneath the stage so that I can play, you know, in, in, in the intermission or the break or whatever. Okay. So now this stage, which was in the shape of his symbol, was massive and it was in the round and it, and it fit all these, this massive band, but it really wasn't high enough to fit a ping pong table. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I think uh, I'm going to guess that the height of the stage is probably about maybe seven or eight feet tall, something like that. But to have, so just, it just was too big. Right. And so they're freaking saying like, it won't fit. And there's an argument and it's just, it was chaos. And just said, well, just make it happen. So what did they end up doing? So, and it, so what ended up happening after a bunch of arguments and Opie, who was the production manager, who was, he handled everything so great. He was awesome. He, he basically just said, do what he asks get the ping pong table. Like, it's not, blah, blah, it's not going to, and they're like, just do it. So they're like, well, how, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of like that question I was saying before, like, 
you know, you just don't say no. Do you know what I mean? Like he wants, he wants to see it happen. So no joke. Five minutes later, something, um, I see a, a crew of maybe, maybe three dudes carrying this ping pong table in pieces over to the stage. And I'm no joke. Right. When like the audience could see them, the lights went out and the show started. Oh my God. He, he just wanted to see them like, just do the ping pong table, cut that thing up, figure That's out right. a way to do it. He didn't even want, he was just like, <laughs> yeah, that's and what so, I'm saying. You wonder how yeah. much of that is persona and how much of that is just, you know, that, that seems to be pure persona, but it's like, it, and the cool thing about that at the end of the tour, um, they made the carpenters made a custom purple ping pong table for him the tour just with. to the size that would fit underneath the stage and spray did he, painted his symbol on it. Did they, did he love it? it? I, I'm assuming he did. I didn't see, you know, the reaction, yeah. but, but I saw it at the end. Like this is what we made for him. For That's awesome. Page. Yeah. So it was um, kind of sweet. Yeah. You know, I, you, you reminded me of something. So you're, you're recording the shows, you're, you know, you, how many shows did you end up recording? Mm, uh, good good I don't know, probably 20 or something, 25. Oh, wow. Maybe, so maybe so well, those were the arena shows, but then did you have to record the after, like, you know, he, he was infamous for playing these, these club dates afterwards. Did he do that on that tour? He did, but I had nothing to do with that. So he, okay, I mean, yeah, because he didn't, had the, he didn't I had like make you guys, of, yeah. Yeah, I, I, luckily at that point, my day was, I, I mean, we're talking every day was a 20 hour day. It, yeah, it was just, um, and not, it didn't need to be, but that's the way it was. Um, so I had the option of going to those, and I did end up going to one of those after shows. But usually at the end of the night, of the night, but at that point, I was toast. I needed to at least get three to four hours if I could of sleep, and because normally the next day started at five thirty in the morning or something, you know. Yeah, so. Yeah. So I, I mean I, that's I, that, I, that's touring. I mean that's why that's why you're not a, a, a live sound oh. engineer. And that's why live sound engineers are a very specific breed of person because Definitely. what I always found when I was younger and you know you, you would do a show or you would play you know do a venue and you I did live sound at a venue for a while. Um, it was fun to like do the different bands each night. I worked at a venue that had country bands a couple nights a week and it had rock bands and it had big it had a big band. So you know as an engineer I was mixing different types of music and that in terms of oh, I didn't and know had no did real cool. gear there was no compression at this place it was just a yeah. board it was like the most throw and go thing ever yeah. but that's the best you know, way to learn though about sound but it was it was yeah. fun to do that but i wasn't on the road the road is very different because you're you're basically on someone else's dollar on, on their command and without without you know if you can't be part of that system you're basically on call all the time you, you really have no excuse to be doing anything else and if yeah. you're not the band, I just found that, you know, as a musician and a producer, that wasn't that interesting to me because I didn't want to be at someone's beck and call. Right. And I'm sure you felt the same. It was fun yeah. for those. Like, like, tell me, tell me a little bit about the Nine Inch Nails gig that brought you into that. Um, and then let's, and then let's get, talk about the Looking Glass. Cause I think, is yeah. that where that I met up. you was through C Christian and Caroline at the Looking Glass or did we know each well, other? Well, I think just sep I mean, it was definitely through Christian and Caroline, but, but, um, I don't know if we were, I think it was just socially. And then, do you know what I mean? I, I yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, that was definitely like looking glass days of, you know, so that, yeah, obviously. So that's where I started my internship then became an assistant and then went freelance after you became a, a freelance uh, engineer. But um, yeah, yeah. At that point. Um, Talk a little know, bit about, about nine inch nails. Cause again, that sounds like a sonically and complete, like um, technically interesting gig to have because the band is a hybrid band of electronics, live instruments, and yeah. I don't know how much of it is too like a, um, I don't want to say a click track, but like it's a production. There's a production going on because there's a lot of visual elements. The production. They have a very cool and unusual setup that people would not expect, but s some people are aware of it. But it's, um, they have a guy in, in, I mean, first of all, it was great because I'm just like Prince, I'm a huge Nine Inch Nails fan, so I was just lucked out to, to get that also through my buddy P. Kepler. But um, basically, they have a setup where it's a live band, um, but instead of a traditional playback system where you have whatever, Pro Tools, Ableton, Logic, whatever it is, running a sequence with clicks, right. um, they have a guy who's sort of 
and, and I don't know if he's still in, he, I'm guessing he's still in the band, but um, he's basically like a performer slash playback person. And he sits off stage with a massive rig and he's triggering the playback elements live. Yeah. So he's performing, but because of the nature of the shows and how unpredictable they can be and how unpredictable Trent can be, you know, depending on, you know, the energy level of the night, really, it's sort of like there may be things that need to be stopped and stuff in, in the sequence. Um, it, it's pretty, it's actually a pretty sophisticated setup. Um, and that was a while ago. So I, I, they're probably doing something similar to that now. Maybe it's updated, but, um, you know, we, this is to totally digress. I played in a, in a hair metal band when I was in <laughs> high school, right? And we, the guys... This is the one I have the picture for? Yes. Yeah. The guys, even though it was a rock band, they were pretty up on the concept of being able to use sampled material. It, what we were trying to do is do a little bit more for the show. And yeah. we had very big background vocals for a lot of the songs. And we didn't want to play to a click track or play along to a live you know, like, like you're saying, like a sequence. Yeah. So yeah. what we did is we had a guy who was playing keyboards, but and he would play keyboards on some songs. But what we had done is took all of the, the, the background vocals from the songs and we put them, we sampled them and put them on keys on a keyboard. Yeah. Now, this was back before you could change the tempo of samples live and do all that stuff like you can now. Right. But so what we had to do with the drummers, the drummer had to play with a metronome counter on his snare. And it would tell him, you know, oh, if wow. he was in range of where he needed to be when, like, so he wasn't really playing to a click per se. Oh, he would start yeah. with a click, but he would then play and he would just watch the tempo on the snare so that he would be in range so that he wouldn't, like, drift. You know, because in a rock show, you get excited, you play a little bit faster. Yeah. Or you play. yeah. So he would play um, with this sort of, like, click mechanism, you know, right? And then the keyboard player would fly in the background vocals with a, like he would press them, yeah. You know, like as we would go up to the mic to sing the background vocals, yeah. it'd be reinforced by him playing them like it was a keyboard, and he'd have to play them in time. And yeah. there would be times once in a while where he would make a mistake, or the band had done something different, so he had to be able to. And that's why we had it so he could play that's, it as, that's as an cool. instrument, yeah. so that we wouldn't get trapped in a sequence. And this it, was just for a metal band. This wasn't like you know. That, that's like very that's very sophisticated for a metal band. I mean, right? it sort of, very it sort for of metal, reminds me like, of like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, yeah, it's, it, but we're not Nine Inch Nails. It's not like Nine Inch Nails or Skinny Puppy. There was this huge performance that went with it. Yeah, and yeah. you know that was really cool because you 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 knew like somebody couldn't all be live. Right. I mean, it reminds me of like the old like seeing Depeche Mode come up and how they would right. use it, or, or or Public Enemy how they t they were doing live triggering of that and it's sort of a just a very modern version of that and so sort of like what you were doing too so I mean I think that's really cool it certainly it makes it like a real performance you have to be on it's not like you can just pr press play and walk away you right know, you can't you can't do that so um yeah, well, I, I remember when he was touring with like five guitar players at one point. I was like, "What is that? Why would you have that many people on?" St I mean, and I, 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 you know, as a kid, I never because I was like, "Yeah, you need two guitar players at the most, or three if the singer plays as well, right?" <laughs> but he just was going for this like, I don't know what it was, it was a like, sonic, a sonic, a freaking sonic assault. But I mean, it, one cool thing about that tour, and then and then we can talk about Looking Glass or whatever we want. But um, is that Trent had a bunch of mics on stage. I don't know how many, I'm going to guess eight or something, which most singers have one, maybe two, you know, if they, they're one and then maybe one on a stand, if they're doing a, you know, whatever. Right. Usually it's one, maybe two. He had like eight mics on stage because obviously depending on where he was, but also some had effects going to them and others he might destroy. So <laughs> there, <laughs> but he had a guy. These are my destroy I, mics. Yeah. He had a guy, and I, I can't remember his name right now. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. He's a really cool guy, Yankee fan, cool dude. And he, he had one job on, on during the shows, and that was that he had a custom-made mic switcher system that was connected, intertwined between all the, 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 the routing feeding the desks. And what would happen is that because there's so much chaos going on during a show, and depending, again, on what Trent's doing... Um, he basically, his job was to look at Trent and 
figure out which mic he was on and switch that mic on for that moment. So he just sat there basically right underneath um, or right, right below the front of the stage in between the barrier, you know, the fans. So he just got pelted. I mean, this guy got, <laughs> this poor guy Pulling got tortured. The face spit uh, I mean, it was, imagine, you know, front row of Nine Inch Nails fans losing their mind, you know, and just screaming, you know, whatever, had like a hole. And, <laughs> and, and this poor guy, he, so he's sitting there getting pelted and like beer cups and all this. And he's oh. just switching the correct mics on for, for Trent, you know, and he was great at it. And he, I, I, I think at the time he had been doing that for a long time. I, I love that those that's always the behind the stage stuff that people don't really understand what it takes to put on a show because you see a performer go up there and they, they do their thing and it's magical. But, you know, from the from the backstage view, it's all held to go together with duct tape and chewing gum. <laughs> you know, like that's a dude switching, you know, things like the first experience I had with that was when playing with metal bands in bigger, bigger places where they were no longer changing, they were no longer doing the foot switches for themselves. They weren't changing oh, yeah. their sounds. And as a player, it was really confusing to me. I would be like, why aren't they the ones who are changing their sounds? They're automatically, who's changing them? Right. And, and I realized that there was a foot switch on stage because they'd have a wah and a volume pedal and stuff. And then a foot switch off stage that their, their roadie, their guitar tech, who knows all the songs, like if, you know, right. was, was switching the stuff for them because they would be busy with, the shenanigans of live performance and it right. became easier once you started the tour people could just switch your sounds for you you know and the fans don't understand that like all the stuff that's happening while you're playing to get that song to sound the way it sounds and you know no, switch know. The, you know you you've run you you know in these stadium shows the guys run all the way like 500 yards up to this thing over there you know it's like an iron maiden show and eddie's <laughs> coming down and the sound is you know someone's somehow the guitar is switching sounds and all that there's no foot switch up there it's like the I i've even seen it where the roadie is actually doing the walk for the good for the guitar player because the guitar player is up there doing the solo yeah. and yeah. the roadies heard the solo enough time that he's doing the, the, the walk there's a lot of i mean that yeah i don't know that people realize how much of that goes on i mean it's like the people that are part of the band sound but they're off stage it's, yeah or it's, the extra guitar player that sits yeah. behind the stage or all yeah. that kind of stuff totally. you know I, I, I forget who it was. I knew a professional guitar player who he had a word for it. It was like auxiliary guitarist on this tour. And I was like, what does that mean? Are you standby in case like a, he's like, no, I'm like the third guitar player that plays the full song because the singer plays, but he comes in and out and he still wants to be plugged in, but the sound can't stop. He's yeah. like, so I play. And there was a guy like the dude you were talking about figuring out the mic situation who would be just kind of riding the faders between the right. auxiliary guitar player and whatever <laughs> um he told me a story of where you know after a while the sound engineer just really wants to just keep it as the auxiliary player because it's much more right. controlled and then they want to limit the the, the live the, the singer and he, the, you know the singer caught him doing that and was pissed of course but you know as a live show goes it's probably a safer way of doing the music just having to yeah. play through yeah all, all the you know Live, yeah. live show tricks. I know, I know. I mean, it, it's it's not necessary that everybody, know, like the public, the audience, you know, they don't care. They just want to see a great show. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just like making a record, too. They don't care. They just want to hear a great record. They don't really care what goes on, at least mostly. They don't care what goes on now, in we, the studio. You, you, you and know, I but, recently yeah. did a record together for, for a young band, Giant Kiwanis. And yeah. this is the first time, I've, I don't know how many years I've known you, how many... 20 years? 19. So we've known each other for two decades. Yeah. We both are producer <laughs> engineers. We both live in the city. We both love a lot of the same music. We both, you know, you work on a lot of rock stuff. That's mainly your forte. I'm, I'm more just anything pop, which entails indie rock and all that other stuff too. But we finally got to work on stuff together. And, 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 um, for me, that was really special because nowadays when you get yeah. to work on records, it's usually just by yourself and like one artist. You know, know, you I don't know. get any help. And I was telling Wolf we, I, when I did the, the re-up with Wolf, A, I got to, we got to use Wolf's quote drum kit, which was special yeah, yeah. for me. Yeah. Your buddy set it up, which made it sound amazing. Yeah, yeah. The studio was amazing. You brought that in. I needed you because I don't work on consoles. That's not my forte. I'm an in-the-box kind of guy. So I was like, yeah. A, I don't track drums. B, I don't use consoles very often, right? So as, 
you know, an artist always has the, the dream, oh, I'm going to go into the studio and I'm going to work on the big recording console and that's going to be great and all this and that. But that's not how a lot of records are made these days. It's, it's a very oh, wow. unique set of circumstances where you get to be able to afford and do that. So yeah. for me, it was really special because I was like, oh, cool, we're going to be in the studio, we got to hang out, have a good time. Oh, it was so, great, dude. It was awesome. I mean, I thought we were probably having even more fun than they were. <laughs> the band. I mean, I think they were having fun, but we were kind of like just being usual donut and cheeseburger head, you know? Yeah. And so they probably, you know, maybe that was fine for them, I'm guessing. No, no, dude, they, they oh, had a yeah. good time. That was, yeah, a, yeah. that was a good time. My favorite part of that session was um, we would track, so let me set the stage for people. We're tracking yeah. drums for four or five songs for this indie rock band. And the drummer didn't live in New York at the time. So he was coming in to track the drums, which is very stressful to begin. Oh, that's right. Where did he live? I forgot. New Jersey or something? No, 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 no. It was, it was like Texas or something like that. Somewhere. Oh, he lived that far away. It was something like that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. I didn't remember. So he, I can't remember where um, JD was, where he's living, but he, you know, he had the, he flew in to do the drum tracking we have a click track, a tempo track that he's playing off of. Yeah. We're producing the drums as he's like basically playing the parts. We're listening to the drum production as we're going down and we're helping him, re- you know, refine the parts as we're going. And it's funny, the two of us communicate. People should know Mario is an excellent drummer. So having, not only is he tracking the drums, he's an excellent I drummer. And I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm refining the beats by you know, pounding <laughs> on my chest and my leg. You know, and, and and with the two of us speaking that language together, and this oh, video totally. that was a, was amazing. I mean, that look. I mean, well, we're both. I mean, my roots are from like being in like hard rock or metal bands. So my right. whole dialogue from my, you know, and you know this too, is like no, no, no. It needs to go. Bom, 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 bom. That's how it needs to go. You know, exactly. Like flam tap, flam tap, brum brum flam. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that was great. I mean, it's, I think ama- they... it's amazing someone married me with that with that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Oh, no, I don't bring, I don't bring that part of it home that much. Yeah. I'm just really weird with my kids. But like, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll do that. I've been do or I've been doing that since basically I was 15 years old. You know, yeah. all of a sudden, at some point, something hits you. I mean, especially for drummers. But probably for most people, especially in metal bands, there's a certain point it hits your head and it takes over, and your whole dot, your whole vocabulary is like jug, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then that's it. that's just the way it is at that point. You know, you can't you can't change that. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie's making fun of us. She's yeah. she, she has to oh. She has to <laughs> at least we're, at least we're not terrible musos. So it's like everything we do is a muso thing. I know people are so nerdy on that but definitely yeah. not normal people let's no, talk about I mean, the looking like glass a little bit because yeah. another totally random factoid about our relationship and how we kind of met was that i had been signed to ohm records in san francisco i'm living on 43rd street in new york with fred two of the people at ohm records christian and caroline who were in san francisco okay yeah, caroline a- alonzo and christian Relish. right they Very become good. a couple while they're while they're at the label they end up moving to New York, and where do they end up living? A, an avenue down the road from where I live, <laughs> which is totally impossible for that yeah. to happen. So I'm living on 43rd between 9th and 10th. I think they were living on between 10th and 11th or 11th and 12th, something like that. Uh, yeah, Caroline, chime in. Where, where, where was it? She'll know. 48th and something, yeah? No, I think she was 40. on 43rd. 48th is when she, they bought the place eventually. She was living, living on the same block as I was. Oh, I see. Block. Okay, got it. And then we were going out and getting blotto every night. You know, as yeah. you do, and that's yeah. how I met you. But then he yeah. also Christian got a, a job at the Looking Glasses. Yeah, I don't remember if he was studio manager, how he started or whatever. And the, and for those people, the Looking Glass was Philip Glass and David Bowie's joint venture of a studio, tenth and eleventh. Yeah, so you're literally one block away from me. memory. Yeah. So, um, and that the fact that that happened, yeah, forty third. The fact that that all happened, that we were all, and then I meet you. Then there's this whole weird synergy with. Yeah. Um, you at the Looking Glass, Philip Glass, which is a really weird combination to me that Philip Glass and David Bowie had a studio together. Although, can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's a, I mean, now I'm getting into the adult geeky version of myself, but yeah, it's not that, <laughs> it's not, a, yeah, so I started out as a metal kid and quickly turned into the art rock, um, you know, whatever guy, but um, it's not that weird to me. I mean, I know David was always really fond of Philip Glass, and so 
it, it, in, a, in a way, it felt pretty normal, actually, for, to me. Um, so I, I can't remember when I found that out, but it was some in, sometime in like the mid to late, I guess late 90s yeah. that I found out that was sort of like the studio where both of them were working. I mean, I was aware of Phil Glass. I had a couple of his albums. I wasn't um, a big student of it or anything. I wasn't a classical um, classical yeah. trained musician or anything. Um, but I, I liked some of the stuff and grew to like it more. But um, of course, David, that was like my big, you know, big obsession. So I was studying. Okay, where, where did, where, where does he work? You know, so it was very lucky for me to be able to get the internship at that studio because I, you know, you know, ended up just befriending him and just being very lucky about the whole thing. But um, but basically, them were them sharing that space to me actually made a lot of sense. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and, and technically, it was Philip's studio. David would just use it a lot. I didn't I know that. So yeah. it, was, it was the looking yeah. glass. It was Philip's studio, and then, yeah, and then totally he offers Philip. a room to David. And David's kind of in and out doing his thing. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, I think I'm, I'm kind of guessing a little bit here, but basically it was friendly, a friendly environment. Um, it was close to where David lived. Um, and it, But it was also a commercial studio, so it wasn't as if, here, take my studio. I mean, it was still, you know, they're booking the studio like a like any other client it's just a very friendly situation i'm smiling at you right now because i think i'm having a memory of a dave dave navarro story with with the package that was left in the bathroom there can you tell that story or we can't touch on that story i well well, (laughs) (laughs) i just remembered it i was like oh my god i don't know that story enough to to be able to feel confident in saying it yeah christian probably knows the story better than me um. Yeah, there's a couple Dave Navarro stories. I shouldn't basically. Right, I, I really I, don't, don't know. I know a few versions left. of it. Yeah, we yeah. don't have a lot. Of, we have we have 13 minutes yeah. left, and the last five minutes, I want to ask yeah. you some okay. quick questions. But okay, yeah, I yeah. want. I do want to talk about really quickly. You know, because it's such an um, because of David's legacy. Explain. I think the the, the posthumous record that you produced mm-hmm. talk about how that happened and, and, and the thought process behind it, who got to work on it and, and why I think that's really interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it came sort of, it really, it was really surprising that it happened just to start because I, I wasn't expecting that at all, but the, I'll try and sum it up. Basically we did a, a, a single in 2008 together. Um, and it was a old song from the Never Let Me Down album called Time Will Crawl. So he mm-hmm. didn't like he didn't like the production on this album and he wasn't satisfied with it. And for many years he always talked about redoing the album in some way. So he called me one day and basically said, Come over, I got this idea, let's um let's maybe do this track. Well, he wanted to do it. Um and I said, Great what are we doing? And, and he's like, well, we're going to reproduce this track basically. So it was basically in a sense, it was sort of like taking a very eighties, uh, very electro, uh, sort of like eighties drum sounding track and turning it into more of a organic modern song with some life to it and some more acoustic instruments. Yeah. So that happened. We did that electric lady, um, real drums, real strings, all that stuff. Um, and it was great. It turned, he was really, really happy with it, and it it got put out on like a compilation. Um, so it was a pretty under the radar thing, even you know, even for Bowie. But like, so that was two thousand and eight. So, and he had sort of talked about over the years. Sometimes he'd say stuff like, "Yeah, it'd be great to redo that whole album." But I, I always was like, "Yeah, of course it would be." But all right, I, I know. I thought that's not going to happen. You know, to 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 put all that time and do that record, I just didn't see it happening. You know, I I mean, but you never know. So a lot of time went by. Then we did the next day album that was started recording that in secret 2011, 2012 that came out in 2013. Um, but then when he died, um, just right after the black star album came out, um, you know, that obviously was horrible. It was extremely sad, but I didn't think anything was really going to happen on that so i so the estate called me essentially in end of november of 2017 saying let's make this his wishes basically come come true let's let's redo this album so so for better or for worse i i had to be the the um you know the in charge of that 
so it was it was sort of like doing what I thought he would want is basically what it was and and basically redoing every song on that so uh, but keeping his vocal you know right so so it's sort of like sort of like getting a fancy demo and then stripping it down and then just rebuilding it with his band you know or a version of his band you know so like Sterling Campbell who played drums he played on the 2008 version so that was a pretty natural uh, choice for that but the other core group um, which was um, Tim LaFade playing bass and uh, um, David Torn Reeves Cabral's on guitar. They're core Bowie band members, but they had never actually played in that ensemble as a four piece together. Um, so that so that that was cool. But um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was, there was a lot of like um, uh, nods in the direction, especially to basically doing what. I would imagine he would want and what, what we had talked about over the years, you know what I mean? And like his influences, his influences, a lot of them have become my influences too. Mm-hmm. So, so in that, in that way, it wasn't really weird, you know? Um, but yeah, um, it was, it was definitely like an unusual record in that way. I mean, yeah. the idea, so sort of, you're, you're sort of the arms of orchestrating this blueprint yeah of time spent with him manufacturing his wishes by using the musicians who kind of knew David's DNA and and had to sort of self-produce in the fact that they would play a part and maybe then have to say, is this something that David would have taken or is this something that I would have wanted to do and then have to reproduce themselves or you had to reproduce them to be like, let's do this a little bit more. Right. And that's, that's an interesting process to sort of like, because the person is not there anymore to tell yeah. you, Hey man, that's not really that, but I'm the vibe I'm going for, but you well, just- it, it's not, I mean, you're, you're totally right. But at the same time, it's also not as complicated as you, as you might think, because luckily they all had a good sense of, of, of what it's like to be in the room with David, yeah. which it's, it's a very specific type of energy. And, uh, and, and I, and I, I had to say to them every day, like, just pretend David's on the couch, like, like he would normally be, you know what I mean? Pretend he's here. So don't do anything that you wouldn't, that you would do. Was he a bit of a gentleman? Was he? Oh, he was a total gentleman. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he would, but he was very funny. So he's a gentleman, but also like a sarcastic, extremely funny, you know. Sharp tongue. He, yeah. Oh, definitely. He was, he was hilarious, but, but totally totally cool i mean yeah but he he would he would have a certain way of being in the studio that you're you're there to do what he wants to you know what i mean right, as right. long as you're with the parameters of what is needed for that particular song or, i think or you told me once that he that he was a sort of like a one take vocalist kind of guy who yeah. like he would get the production the way he wanted it like Bjork, oh, definitely. and would just come in and do it and be like, that's what it is. That's, uh, that's oh, what definitely. I got. I mean, he would do one or two takes. And, and, and a lot of times the two takes would be because he'd do a take and he'd, he'd listen back and then he'd say, all right, well, let me do a second. And he'd know what he needed to replace or fix from the first take. So it's like, if you got a second take, cool. Maybe you didn't, but like if you got that, you basically had that to to use and he was done he's like all right you know that's it <laughs> that's pretty was, crazy it's great know, i mean he's records, a, he, he, you know most records are doing now it's like you know you're just getting this wall of comping vocal tracks to so many versions of things because you know sometimes i'm going through and picking out one word at a time yeah to put think takes together because you just want it. it was the right angle on the microphone and the right this yeah. right that but some people do have a sound and a swagger to them that's going to translate regardless especially totally. if they if they became popular in the 60s 70s and parts of the 80s because they they had to build up a voice that would stand on its own there wasn't all that processing that we have now right um which i think is really cool yeah yeah i mean he if he was doing backing vocals he would do a lot of he would do a lot of, he wouldn't do multiple takes of the same thing, but he would give you what you needed. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I remember we did this track for a, for the stealth soundtrack and we were working with BT and we were like, it was this sort of like thing that was just specifically for the soundtrack. But, and in, he like was 
doing tons and tons of vocals, but it was all like stacked in layers of vocals, not like, you know, uh, retakes and retakes, just like, you know, tons and tons of vocals. So, so he had that in him too, you know what I mean? But, um, but yeah, for lead vocals, it's like, just sing it, make sure you capture it and it's done. It was like pretty impressive, but yeah. Yeah. Not many performers like that anymore. Uh, No. Yeah. So. Okay, so how are we on time? Are we right. okay? We're good. I got. Is, do you have? Do you have any? Um, do you have a favorite Bowie or a Looking Glass story? You got two minutes to tell me that. Oh God, that you just. <laughs> um, All right, let's talk about something more. Yeah, important. yeah. The, let's talk about yeah. something more important. What donut shops are open in Manhattan right now? Because nothing seems. That's to be. I question. saw the donut plant is not open. They just closed. They tried to open. I was, you know. Krispy Kreme, though, they just did that one I was telling you about the other day. They finally opened right by me, and I got donuts for my building a couple weeks ago. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, which is good because, you know, the Dunkin' Donuts that actually closed right by me, it's like you got a lot of stale donuts there, but Krispy yeah. Kreme is, tends to be fresher. So, but, you know, listen, the, the, for me, I'm still a donut pub. I you love, love the donut pub, yeah. I love you, donut pub. Yeah. But, uh, now, I don't know if that's open right now. I, I haven't been down over there. I don't know. There's one place in Brooklyn that I want to get to. I, and I'm going to forget the name of it. Um, and I started following them on Instagram and I started obsessing about like driving there on a Sunday when I was in Manhattan. <laughs> We're not in Manhattan right now, so we can't get to the, get to the donuts, yeah. but, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'll, I listen, that's, that could be like our first hang half post pandemic is like a donut pub. hang. <laughs> totally. Or, or we got to get the double cheeseburgers. All right. I, yeah, I'm going to hit yeah. you with some, hit you with some questions here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Faith or science. Oh, science. Oh yeah. I remember you doing these. Yeah. Science. Rave or festival. Rave or festival. Oh, a uh, festival. Ocean, lake or desert. Desert. Acid or mushrooms? Mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Big room or small room? Oh, that depends. I can't. That's that's. I can't answer that. What's your superpower? <laughs> My ears. <laughs> um, how would you incorrectly describe your job? Incorrectly. Um, Um. Oh God, you you got me. Um, incorrectly. Um. Yeah, that guy just. Yeah, that guy just makes music in in a studio somehow or something. I remember my dad <laughs> saying that once. My son. Uh, here it is. My son makes music in in Manhattan. I was like, well, not really, but okay, sort of. Yeah. Okay. What animal should survive if only one can survive? Oh. Bees? Is that a count as an animal? Yeah? And I'm not judging. If not yeah. music, then what? Oh, art. Vision. Favorite meal? Sushi. Hunter or gatherer? Oh, God. Both? I don't know. Do you, do you have a favorite deli? <laughs> You know, um, no, but you know what I've been digging recently, which is not really deli, but has sort of really like high end deli sandwiches. Do you know that place, Parm? Oh, yeah. Dude, I had a right, roast beef hero. I got less than 30 yeah. seconds here. Don't okay, even do, it, do it, do it, do it. I'm cutting you up. Okay, <laughs> my favorite question to what's your favorite metal band? Of all time? Okay, that's a tough genre. Okay, I'm just going to say Tool. But I don't know if that counts as metal. But okay. what genre are the Talking Heads? Oh, oh, you did you? I remember you asked somebody this question. Oh God, I don't know. Uh, art rock. Uh, All right, brother. It was so good to see your face. I hope you you're being safe. We have to have donuts soon. Donuts and then cheeseburgers after. All right, man. All right, man.